presentations and some cardiovascular stuff to talk about. And I was going to talk about the cardiovascular system work first, but some of these presentations, because I've seen one part of it, uh, tie right in to, I mean, tie directly into the stuff you should know about. And so I think we'll start with presentations first. I'm just, I'm just getting to my list of who does what when. Okay. All right. And I wonder if we should. I, with your guys' permission, I'm not trying to be sneaky and really trip you up. I'd like to kind of go in the reverse order that I gave them to you yesterday because I saw like Miss Carrillo's presentation and it talks about the heart chambers and it's like so central to what we're doing that I'd rather hear that first and head backwards than to talk about the, uh, the pathologies of the heart and other good stuff too. Um, so that doesn't mean we have to start with Miss Carrillo, but I was, Miss Ablos, how ready are you, by the way? Are you there? I'm here. Yeah. Can you? Are you pr prepared to do your presentation at this time? Sure. Oh, okay. Let's start with you. We're going to do Miss Avalos, then Miss Creo, and then Miss Clayton. So we'll start with Miss. This, this might be interesting. So um, I've talked a lot about the power of the mind and thoughts, but another area that. Uh, really intrigues me is the power of the heart so that's yeah, what i chose I to do my presentation on um the heart has its own nervous system it's called the intrinsic cardiac nervous system scientists refer to this system um, as the heart's brain or heart's intelligence. Uh, research shows that the heart sends more signals to the brain than vice versa. In fact, the heart doesn't need a brain or a body for that matter to keep beating. We've seen this with brain death and when the heart is removed from the body for surgeries and autopsies. Uh, theologians and solid scholars from around the world hold the belief that the heart is an access point to a source of wisdom and intelligence that creates more balance, greater creativity, and enhances your intuitive capabilities. Um, perhaps you guys are already aware of that with the imagery of the sacred heart. Um, everything in the universe is made up of particles and waves of electromagnetic energy. The heart is the most powerful generator um, of this energy in the human body, and it produces the, the largest rhythmic electromagnetic field of uh, the body's organs, of any of the body's organs. So when it's measured with an electrocardiogram, the heart is 60 times greater in amplitude than the electrical activity generated by the brain, and that's pretty powerful. Uh, you can use the heart intelligence and heart energy with loving intentions in your massage therapy practice. It not only improves, improves your application, but it helps create the balance that we so desperately need in this world today. It brings about a greater love, a harmony, and overall well-being for yourself and, and other people. Uh, so that completes my presentation on the power of the heart. Uh, Ms. Avalos, as usual, that was fantastic. But I, I want to especially thank you because you very much confirmed my choice to go in this direction. What a, what a wonderful way to start our discussion uh, about the heart. I think you've really captured the big, big picture as you off, often do. Thank you. It was, it was great. It was fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, just fantastic. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Ms. Carrillo, let's talk about mechanics of the heart. Hi, everyone. So I decided to do my presentation instead of the system of the four chambers of the heart. And I was going to try to explain that, but then I realized they have a flow. So I tried to 
uh, draw it in a way that we can understand where it flows in the heart. So let me get my presentation up. All right, so can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, so this is going to be about the flow of the four chambers of the heart. I numbered them one because it starts from here, it goes to here, and then it's going all the way in here. <laughs> and don't worry, I'll explain it in more detail, but it goes here and here to three, four. So I have to explain some words. Atrium is cavity or passage, and ventricle is hollow part or cavity in an organ in anatomy. On this side, this side, not bad. <laughs> on this side, the blue, this is the right side. The left is like this very bright red side. And these are the blood cells. On the right side with the blue is on their way to the lungs to pick up oxygen. On the left side, they have the oxygen from the lungs. What do you say? <laughs> They have a lot of oxygen from the lungs and they provide, they send it to the aorta. So it goes from here, the blood cell. I'm so nervous on the side. <laughs> You're fine, my dear. Take your time. You're fine. Sir, this is very okay. important. Yeah. So the blood cells go this way, right? And they're going into this area, which we have learned is a cavity or passage. They also can come up here and go all the way in here. And they kind of loop around. And then they go this way. So this is important because it's also going through these things called valves, these orange ones. And there's uh, four different types, the tricuspid, polymary, which polymary is related to lung, uh, mitral, and aortic. So I will also go into more detail because this is very, it's very confusing. So what if we look at it as a different way? We look at it as if we're coming off a road the blood cells are coming off a road and they need to go to a parking lot. And that parking lot leads to a lobby. And that lobby leads to a hall. And the hallway leads to a room. And to make this, this is where the blood cells are coming from. So we, to make it more understandable, I put it into a, as simplified as I could. If we look at the atrium as an architecture, what it means, it means open roof entrance hall. So we can think of the parking lot as the open roof entrance hall. So what if we look at it this way? What if we are coming off a Dysart Road <laughs> and we are going into the atrium, which is the parking lot, <laughs> going to the parking lot. And then we go into the lobby, which is the Royal Hall. And then we go into the hallway. And then we're going into our classrooms. What if we replace the blood cells as students and we replace oxygen as education? So road becomes Dysart Road. Parking lot becomes the Australia parking lot. Lobby becomes the Royal Hall lobby. The hallway is our hallway we walk from Mr. Like this is Mr. Pat Scott's uh, teaching room, and this is where we do our massage. And that that room is going towards the lungs. Yes. So that is the dog of our right side. So now if we have this analogy, is blood cells as students, oxygen is education. So coming from there, the blood cells, which is the students, after our class, where do we go? We usually go home. So we would usually go to on a highway, usually we go on a highway. And then from the highway, we get to what we consider home. So this is us returning with our new education, what we learned from today. So that is the oxygen. And when we, what do we do with this education? We share it with family and we share it with friends, which is the aorta. Aorta shares it to the system of the body. So this is us sharing it as the family and friends, which is the system of the body. And so what helps me, or, and what we could do with the vows 
is it all goes in an order. I marked it blue because because that's it. That's from the parking lot to the lobby. Column A is lobby and hall to the classroom. Mitriol is highway to home. And the aerotic is from home to family and friends. And they have the acronym of TPMA. And for us in this analogy, what can help us remember is T stands for Tapscott, P stands for Palpates, M stands for Mystery Paras, and A stands for Enter. I cannot to wait to share this with Mr. Bar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank so you. I hope uh, that it was a very, it, that was a very hard subject. And I tried to Please make it understandable, like if we were the blood cells, what are we doing? We come to school, get the education. We go home with that education and then we share that education. So our that's experience excellent. and everything. And that's what the blood cells are doing with the oxygen. They come in with uh, no or less oxygen. They go and get the oxygen and then they share the oxygen. The analogy is very appropriate, um, especially because roadways too divide up and divide up and divide up as we go out into the city and such too. So that's yeah. fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hendrickson. Yeah, I just wanted to also add that that was amazing. It really helped. <laughs> Let me understand it because it's very complicated and it's it very hard with some screen. And a great teacher. We're off to a great start. Yes. Thank you. We got the soul of the matter, the soul of the heart, and now the heart of the heart. Good. Um, <laughs> uh, Miss Clayton. You there, Miss Clayton? Okay. I'm here. We can't. Um, Oh, I like this. 10 random facts about the magnus. Okay, cool. The heart is part of the muscular can system in a way. Yes, we can. Okay. Sorry. I've got two things going on here. Cool. I don't know why it is. Oh, oh, hold on. We can see we can see it now and you're not echoing those, but things look good. But now we can't hear you. By the way, everybody, while we're waiting on Miss uh, Clayton, yeah. the heart is included in your muscular system. You have three main muscles in your muscular system, skeletal muscle and smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. We just always talk about skeletal muscle, right? The stuff that makes you move and stand. But the heart is part of the muscular system. Obviously, the heart is part of the cardiovascular system, too. So it depends on how you want to divide stuff up. All right, Miss Clayton. I'm back. Okay. So... Uh, the gluteus maximus is the largest muscle in the body. Its primary function is to support your trunk and maintain appropriate posture. It's also the key muscle that assists you in walking upstairs. Yes. The eye muscles are the busiest muscles in humans. They move approximately 100,000 times a day. And then two other very busy muscles like we talked about are the heart and the diaphragm, which helps us breathe. The smallest muscles that you have in your body are in your ear. The strongest muscle, based on its size, is the masseter, which is your jaw muscle. Uh, you can close your teeth with a force of 200 pounds um, on your molars. The hardest working muscle, as we've talked about, is the heart. Goosebumps are due to tiny muscles present at the bottom of the hair shaft, so when you're cold, your hair muscles are flexing. The sartorius is the longest muscle in the human body, and it's in your thigh um, from your hip um, to your inner inner knee. Um, most of the heat produced in your body comes from muscle contraction. When you're shivering, uh, it's involuntary muscle. It's involuntary um, process where your muscles are contracting to keep you warm. Muscles are heavier than fat. So it's not uncommon for someone who is overweight trying to lose weight to start working out and then to actually gain weight, which can be very frustrating for people as they're like, I'm working out and dieting and I actually weigh more. So I'm sure, I'm sure some of us have, have had that happen. I know I have. Muscles will last twice as long as the amount of time it took to build them up. So what that means is if you spend six weeks 
weight training on your arms and then stop, those muscles will retain their bulge for 12 weeks. There are over 600 muscles, and we know that, but each time you take a step, you're exercising 200 muscles at the same time, which shows you how important walking is. Muscles are more, more metabolically active than fat, which simply means they burn more calories than fat, even at rest, a muscle will burn calories. Again, that's a reason to work out your muscles because you'll be able to burn more calories and thus eat more food if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> the tongue is made up of eight different muscles that are all intertwined to form what is known as a muscular hydrostat. And they're the only muscles in the body to work independently from the skeleton. If we had all our muscles in our body pull in one direction, we could lift 25 tons. Probably it's got a lot of power. Humans are not appropriate prey for great white sharks because the shark's digestion process is too slow to cope with a human's high ratio of bone to muscle and fat. This one is, I think, really interesting. In 1936, fitness expert Jack Lane opened the United States' first health and fitness club, and it was in Oakland, California. And at the time, doctors advised their patients to stay away from this health club uh, because it was a business totally unheard of, and they warned their patients that Jack Lane was an exercise nut, and the programs would make them muscle-bound and cause severe medical problems. <laughs> Uh, studies have found that drinking watermelon juice before a workout helps reduce muscle soreness. So if any of you have watermelon juice laying around, it's good. Um, human finger, fingers are constructed of ligaments, tendons, and bones. They actually have no muscle. The fingers move because of the muscles in the palm and the forearms. Almost done. Mentally, doing a task makes you better at it. You can train your music skills or your muscles just by imagining the training. Your mind can barely tell the difference. So that's cool because I was like, oh, I can just work out from you know sitting down or laying down. But I don't know if that's really true, but I'm gonna try it definitely. And then I ended with this one because I know Mr. Pop Scott likes feet, but I had no idea there were over a hundred muscles in each of your feet, in addition to twenty-three bones and thirty-three joints. So our feet are pretty complex. Pretty important. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Awesome. Fun facts. I love I love all of it actually. Yeah. Okay. Moving right along here. Now I think we're kind of set up to, you know, talk about uh, conditions. All right. So uh, we're gonna go Miss Young, then Mr. Thornton, Miss Stevens, uh, Mr. Snell, Mr. Singletary, and Miss Savarino. So Miss Young, will you tell us about anemia? Miss Young, <laughs> are you there? Oh, so oh, good. I'm like, are you asleep? <laughs> no, my mom was next to me, and we were looking at you. Ah. I hope that's a good thing. Anyway, we went out of order, so I wasn't expecting it. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, I was trying to frame the discussion. I actually like the order we've gone in. But anyway, tell us about anemia. Just ten sentences or less. All right. Anemia is a reduction in the quality quantities of either RBCs, which is red blood, red blood cells, or hemoglobin, which yeah. impairs blood's ability to carry oxygen to blood cells. And it it's a common blood disorder that approximately affects like three point million, three point five million people in the U.S. Uh, some of the symptoms are dizziness, fatigue, lightheadedness, I don't know how to say this word, uh, malaise, M-A-L-A-I-S-E? Malaise? I used to know what that I think meant. So. Yeah. Uh, brittle nails, yep. headache, pallor, shortness of breath, weakness, fast heart rate, or palpation. Uh, some treatments that can be performed are blood transfusions for blood loss, medications to induce blood loss, uh, vitamins, and medications to induce blood production. 
if anemia is not treated for a long a long period, it can lead to serious complications. These include heart failure, severe weakness, and poor immunity. Beautiful. To help, you can eat rich, rich iron foods like red meat, pork, poultry, seafood, beans, dark green, leafy vegetables, dried fruit, and peas. So being vegan or vegetarian would suck with anemia. I, I resemble that remark. Um, <laughs> well, you would have to find a lot more, and I feel like you'd be eating a lot more vitamins because most of it's meat. Yeah, I actually, I think pound for pound, broccoli has more iron in it than meat. But well, that's a good thing for anemic people. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, thank you, Michonne. That's fantastic, though. Um, and, yeah, anemia means your red blood cells, you either don't have enough of them or they're not picking up oxygen. So you're oxygen I starved. That's yeah. I actually was done just letting you know. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. I, was, I just didn't want you to like move on and hold on that one yet. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Cool. Anything else, ma'am? I didn't mean to cut you off. Yes. Uh, so, how to avoid getting anemia is eating rich iron foods, as like I said, uh, and eating or drinking uh, vitamin C rich foods. And avoid drinking tea or coffee with your meals, which is going to suck. Yeah. But most anemia is passed down, but a rare and, and serious uh, apolastic uh, anemia can develop at any age. Uh, massaging an anemic person is fine, but if they are in the advanced stages of sickle cell disease or apolastic anemia, use lighter pressure on a scale of 1 to 10, about a 3. And children diagnosed with sickle cell disease experience a reduction of pain, depression, and anxiety while receiving that these massages from their parents. Cool. And that's it. Thank you, ma'am. So massage helps. That's awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, da -da 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 -da. Mr. Thornton, angina yeah. pectoris <laughs> in 10 sentences or less. I'm trying to narrow you guys down. All right, y'all ready? We're ready, sir. Okay, um, angina pectoris is a condition marked by severe pain in the chest, often also spreading to the shoulders, arms, and neck, caused by an inadequate blood supply to the heart. Yeah. Uh, it is non-life threatening, but the um, effects does receive doesn't receive enough blood and oxygen. Not enough blood supply is called ischemia. Ischemia. Ischemia and can be a symptom of coronary artery disease, yes. which is CAD. Yeah. Um, the chest pains are squeezing, pressure, heaviness, tightness, or pain in your chest. Yeah. Ways to cure, stop, relax, rest, lie down. If you can take a uh, nitroglycerin, or yeah, glycerin. nitroglycerin, it it, it uh, expands your blood vessels. Yes. If the pain or discomfort doesn't stop, you obviously need to tell somebody. You need to seek some medical attention. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, uh, and last, there are four types of angina. One uh, is stable angina. Um, slash angina pectoris, two unstable angina, three variant transmental angina, and four microvascular angina. Awesome. Thank you. Was that, was that it, sir? Yeah, that's it. Good. Yeah, so uh, it just actually means chest pain. <laughs> angina pectoris. Uh, it, it can be nothing, by the way, everybody. It can be absolutely nothing, basically, but it can mean that you have not enough blood flow going to your heart, and so you're getting heart cramping. And obviously, it's something to get checked out if it happens more than once kind of thing. Um, so, awesome. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, Miss Stevens, atherosclerosis. I think I said it right today. Oh, hold on. Hold on one second, Mr. Thornton. You're, I'm going to mute you, sir. Good. Okay. 
No, you're fine. I just didn't want you to know, I didn't want you to know you weren't on mute. Anyway, Miss Stevens, sorry. Take it away. I just want to make sure. I practiced pronouncing it, but you said atherosclerosis? Atherosclerosis. Sclerosis. Okay. Huh. There was many. I looked it up and I saw at least three different. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm not, I'm obviously not an expert because I feel drunk every time I say right. it. But anyway, yes. Okay. So, atherosclerosis is the presence of plaque within arteries. Um, these lesions are also called atherosclerotic plaque and can resist blood flow and promote formations of blood clots. Um, the risk, factor, risk factors of this is high cholesterol, uh, high blood pressure, smoking, obesity, unhealthy diet. Um, it can lead to a heart attack or stroke with the built-up plaque. Um, there's not really a cure for this. Once you have it, it's kind of there to stay. But if it's caught early enough, um, and you change with medication and like a change of lifestyle, kind of, you can slow the progression of it or maybe stop it. Um, but it can affect like your limbs. So like you'll have really bad chest pains, but then you can also it can affect, you know, numbness or pain in like your limbs or it can affect organs, um, like in the kidneys and then it can cause organ failure. Yeah. That's about all I have. That's perfect. I'm sorry, I just didn't want to cut you off. But I think that's actually perfect. Yeah, so guys, have you ever had a drain stop up at your house and they come snake it out and they pull out all this grease and hair and stuff, right? Because that goes down your your arteries and veins are the same way they can get clogged with grease <laughs> they can get plaque and they can get yes cholesterol and grease in your veins and arteries and then stuff doesn't go through it is very very similar it is plumbing so that was awesome thank you mr snell uh congestive heart failure uh yes okay so congestive heart failure um so heart failure is due to the inability of the heart to keep up with the normal functions. So basically the heart uh, fails to pump blood efficiently. Um, eventually liquid is backed up into the lungs and uh, that causes the blood not to circulate. Uh, when that occurs, the heart cannot provide blood flow throughout the body's organs such as the brain, liver, and kidneys. And this does put, cause severe damage um, and heart failure can be fatal and should be treated immediately. Yeah, yeah, you're and right. The body? Yeah. yeah, the heart is actually failing in its ability to pump properly. You're absolutely right. Uh, and it has to pump very, very well to keep doing what it's doing. And yes, you can die from it. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mr. Singletary, coronary artery disease, sir. Yes, sir. Ten sentences or less. Okay. Get me. Uh, okay. I'll, keep it, I'll keep it brief. Sorry. Yep. Uh, according to the CDC, coronary artery disease, or sometimes called CAD, is the most common type of heart disease in the United States. It is also termed as ish ischemic is heart disease. Yeah. Ischemic. Yeah. Ischemic. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So. Yeah. Uh, CAD is the is caused by plaque buildup in the walls of the artery that supply blood to the heart and other parts of the body. Plaque is made up of deposits of cholesterol and other substances in the arteries. What happens with the plaque over a period of time is that the plaque will cause the insides of our arteries to narrow and can partially or totally block the passageway flow of blood or atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis. I don't know where, how we want to pronounce it. Uh, some symptoms of CAD are chest pain, shortness of breath, heart attack, pain or discomfort in the arm or shoulders, weakness and lightheadedness, cold sweats, and over time, this can weaken, CAD can weaken the heart muscles. Um, what was I say? Uh, some causes of CAD are smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, and insulin resistance or just simply just not being active, not doing anything at all. And I, I can, I have personal knowledge of that because my mother, um, she passed away years ago and she, um, she retired from the IRS 
And after that, she just decided, well, I'm retired. I'm not going to do anything. And we let her get away with it. And eventually, things caught up to her and she passed away. Um, treatment for CAD, number one thing is physical activity. And another, another big thing is education about your healthy living, including your eating habits, smoking, attempting to quit, and massage therapy. And the end. I love it. Perfect. Thank you. By the way, everybody, you've heard the word ischemia a couple of times now in these presentations. Ischemia means lack of blood to an area. And we talk about even in massage, like on somebody's body, where it seems like an area is kind of cold and not getting a lot of blood flow. And we want to bring blood flow to areas of ischemia. But ischemia of your heart muscle is no bueno, right? Because that's not just cold skin. That's, that's a muscle that needs lots of blood going to it. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Savarino. Uh, don't worry about the bacon. It's okay. Um, but I'm sure the espresso will, will bend the espresso and the bowl. It'll, yeah, it'll flush it off. It'll, it'll vibration it out. Yeah. I want to eat bacon. Yes. By the way, as much as I actually think it's good to reduce your cholesterol and things like that, um, uh, your attitude has a lot to do with the health of your heart, as Miss Ab Abelos kind of told us. Like, you being a happy person really does have a lot to do with your heart health. Anyway, please tell us what DVT is. What is this strange Perfect. thing? Beautiful. DVT, deep vein thrombosis, it is inflammation of uh, deep veins with blood clot formation. That's what DVT stands for. Basically, the inflammation attracts platelets and then they become, they aggregate to form clots near a venous valve, like Ms. Carrito so beautifully diagrammed for us. Um, and then they can also restrict blood flow, and it is super, super important not to massage somebody with this condition. Like, I repeat, you could kill them. Do not, yeah. you know, massage somebody with this condition. The clots can become dislodged, and that is called uh, thromboemboli. Is that how you say it? I've um, actually never heard that term, but you're right. They can become dislodged. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So by compressing the legs, there's a possibility that it can shoot up and travel and lodge into a pulmonary artery, which then can lead to a pulmonary embolism. And you know, that's life-threatening and that's true. Yeah. So you want to postpone all the side and you want to screen the at-risk clients for DVT. And the at-risk people are those who are obese, those who have cancer, who are pregnant, taking birth control, and who have just been inactive for a really long time, or if you like fly and then you sit down and yeah. fly yourself. And um, the symptoms are, uh, unilateral leg swelling, heat, redness, pain, and tenderness. Beautiful. Beautiful. That was that was so like tight. Thank you. Um, yeah, everybody. DVT. Uh, one of the symptoms of it is, and Miss Everino said it perfectly. Unilateral, one leg. It's usually in the legs, by the way. It's usually deep veins in your legs. One leg seems hot, swollen, sensitive, more so than the other leg. When you see unevenness in the body like this, you should be like, ding, ding, something's not right. Uh, and that does not mean somebody has DVT. Don't be like, oh my God, you got DVT, you're going to die. No, just tell them, like, I don't think I should massage you. You should get this checked out because all they have to do is go for a pain-free ultrasound. They can often do it at the urgent care places, and the ultrasound will show the blood clot if it's there. But the, the worry is that deep massage will free up the blood clot. It'll get up to their lungs, and then they suffocate actually so it, it, it is very common it's not very common but it's more common with people who are very overweight or pregnant because kind of the pressure it puts in the hard time getting blood back up to them so we will talk about dvt again when we talk about pregnancy massage but that was honestly 10 of the best sentences you could say about it like that was very tight that's exactly what i would say uh miss hendrickson please um what do doctors do when they find that like, do they do surgery or what do you no, do? No, usually that? they usually they give you a drug to break up the blood clot. They give, give you everything. It's terrible. Yeah. Oh. There you go. That's what they do. Right. And they have to monitor you very carefully because the drug itself can cause other problems too. Um, yeah, right. Do. Right. Exactly. So, but anyway, um, the good news is it's it's very curable if they catch it kind of thing, right? Um, and I've known... I've known a couple of people that have had it and, and they caught it and they gave them that drug and kind of cleared it out of their body and they were they were fine. They were just very careful if they ever had those symptoms again kind of thing. So look for really uneven 
pain, swelling, and heat, especially the legs, is a sign of DVT. And Ms. Savarino, I love how adamant she was. It is a no massage situation. You you almost never hear me say that. I'm always like, yeah, just massage them, just be light. They're on fire, just massage them. You know, whatever. But this one, don't massage them. Send them on their way, say it's probably okay, but you should get it checked out right away. Probably okay, but you should get it checked out right away and go to an urgent care, explain what's going on, and they'll ultrasound it, and you'll know right away if there's a problem or not. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I love it. Okay. Um, Mr. I think it's Mr. Let me just make sure. Mr. Richards. Did it do? Yes. By the way, we're going to go Mr. Richards, Miss Raider, Miss Pugh, Mr. Overman, Miss Osuna, and Mr. Manzanares. So, Mr. Richards, what What's hypertension? Okay, so hypertension is when blood pressure increases past the normal range. There are different stages of hypertension. I'll give you a couple. Stage 1 is 140 over 90 or more. Stage 2 is 140 to 159 over 100 or more. Anything over stage 2, please seek medical advice. Um, you're probably going to need some surgery or some tablets or, you know, beyond endoscope. Um, normal range of blood pressure is 120 over 80. Blood pressure is the amount of pressure the blood places on the vessel walls. Stroke volume times heart rate equals cardiac output. Blood vessels are hollow spaces and blood flows through them to the heart. When a contraction occurs, the hollow space becomes narrower, which restricts normal blood flow. This is called systemic vascular resistance. SVR, blood volume and contractibility, contractility, is responsible for hypertension. Studies have shown that lowering, lowering blood pressure by just five millimeters of mercury reduces the chance of a stroke by 34%. Lifestyle changes, such as diet and physical exercises reduces pressure, which is hypertension. That was perfect. Yeah. So hyper, everybody, remember hyper means high. It's just high blood pressure. Okay. And it's very, very, very serious. However, not if they're getting a massage. It doesn't matter if they're getting a massage. I worry about hypo blood pressure, low blood pressure. Their blood pressure is going to drop at the massage table. So I, I don't ever tell clients this because it makes it sound like I don't care. But they're like, just to let you know I got high blood pressure. In the back of my head, I'm like, I don't care. Get on the table. Um, because I'm like, this is the best thing you could be doing. I'm going to lay down and you're going to lay down. I'm going to rub you. You're going to be great. Again, if I was a personal trainer, it'd be different. I'd be worried. but And I might be worried for their overall health. But I am not worried for massage-wise. So hyper blood pressure. Hypertension, high blood pressure, hypo, hypo tension, that's a bigger concern. They get up off the table, they pass out, and they hit their head. That's what happens. That's why I'm worried about low blood pressure. I just realized how long we've been going. I know Miss Raider is next, but let's take our 15-minute break. Come back at 9.56. 9.56, everybody. All right. Okay, sorry. Take it away. Will you tell us about myocardial infarction? Yeah. I'm noticing a trend with all these pathologies as far as risk factors go. Um, seems like a lot of them have the same risk factors. But anyway, um, myocardial infarction is a sudden disruption of blood flow to the heart. Um, it can be caused, um, it's usually caused when uh, one or more coronary arteries become blocked, usually from buildup of fatty deposits including cholesterol that form plaques, which narrows the arteries. Another cause is a spasm of the coronary artery that shuts down blood flow to part of the heart muscle. Um, using Tabasco or illicit drugs like cocaine can cause this kind of spasm. Mm -hmm. Risk factors include, but are not limited to, um, age, drug and tobacco use, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, diabetes, stress, and lack of physical activity. Um, symptoms may vary um, from person to person. Some people will not have any symptoms at all until they actually have a heart attack. 
but some symptoms do include pressure or tightness in the chest or arms, nausea, indigestion, heartburn, shortness of breath, fatigue, and lightheadedness. If a client has a heart attack while at your facility, call 911 first and then check to see if they're breathing or if they have a pulse. If they don't, start CPR and continue until help arrives. If you have a client that's had a heart attack recently or is still weak and debilitated, then you can massage, but you want to apply light pressure, like a three on a 10-point scale. And if the client is further along and has regained most of their strength, massage is okay. And just make sure you communicate with them, with your client, and request feedback regarding pressure and tolerance with the joint movement. And then you can modify the massage according to the comment. And that is it. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. By the way, thank you, Ms. Rader, for pointing out that these are common risk factors seem to be true for all heart stuff. It's all diet, exercise, don't do drugs, don't smoke. It really is. I mean, like, I mean, stuff we know, but it's, this is the stuff for heart stuff. There's just no doubt about it. And yeah, call 911. Yeah, if you think somebody's having a heart attack, that's the first thing to do. Okay, Ms. Pugh, peripheral arterial disease. All right, peripheral artery disease, also called PAD, um, is a common circulatory problem in which narrowed arteries reduce blood flow to your limbs. When you develop peripheral artery disease, your legs or arms, usually your legs, don't receive enough blood flow to keep up with demand. This may cause symptoms such as leg pain when walking, called claudication. Peripheral artery disease is also likely to be a sign of buildup of fatty deposits in your arteries, atherosclerosis. This condition may narrow your arteries and reduce blood flow to your legs and occasionally your arms. You often can successfully treat peripheral artery disease by exercising, eating a healthy diet, and quitting tobacco in any form. And that's it. That's perfect. Thank you. Hey, everybody, by the way, this is, uh, so this is your arteries getting clogged that feed your arms and legs, your peripheral stuff, right? The one thing to remember about this disease is they often call it the canary in the coal mine. So canaries, they used to carry canaries in the coal mine because they're much more sensitive to uh, lack of oxygen and buildup of toxic gases than humans are. So if the canary died, you knew to get out of the coal mine. So the reason they call this a canary in the coal mine kind of disease is yeah, right now just your arms and legs are hurting, but it could mean you are clogging other um, other veins in your, your body and other arteries, which could be your heart, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that, but it suggests that you're clogging up plumbing in your body, and it's very likely you've clogged up other stuff too. And not to be overly share here, um, this is true with certain types of impotency too, uh, a, a, not a male erectile dysfunction, not all of it, but some of it can be a sign that veins and arteries are getting clogged, and that's why they're having a hard time with that. And they call that a canary in the coal mine thing, too. So somebody who's going to get uh, Viagra might also want to check with their doctor to make sure why they're having that problem, because it can be a sign, again, of plumbing being clogged, right? That, too, is an appendage. So all these appendages, yes, but they can be a sign of a problem that's much bigger. That's the only point I want to make. Uh, thank you. Perfect. Mr. Oberman. Phlebitis. Yes, phlebitis, uh, phlebitis is inflammation of the veins. It is most likely to occur in extremities, but is not limited to them. Phlebitis can affect any vein. Reduced blood flow, which is known as venous stasis, is most com the most common cause of phlebitis. And it usually occurs after acute or chronic infection, surgery, pregnancy, childbirth, Prolonged sitting, for example, while you're binge watching Squid Games, <laughs> standing, or immobilization. Phlebitis is a local contraindication, so do not massage the affected area because it may be painful. And for the client's comfort, you can elevate their legs above their heart using the poster. Crap, I need three more sentences. That was one. This is the last. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, that was good. And I was ready for the sentences. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Levitis, good. We'll take it. Perfect, tight, everything. Um, Ms. Osuda, 
Raynaud's disease? Yes. Um, Raynaud's uh, disease is periodic episodes of myospasms in the fingers and toes and can also affect the tip of the nose, part of the ear, cheeks, and the tongue. If the condition is, is primary without another underlying disease, it is called Raynaud's disease. But if there's a secondary to another disease, like um, scleroderma, it is called Raynaud's syndrome. This is because the disease, because the disease is unclear, but are, I'm sorry, the cause of the disease is unclear, but are precipitated by cold water, emotional stress, cold weather, emotional stress, and smoking. This di disease affects approximately 1.3 million Americans and is more common in females than in males. Um, with massage therapy, if a client experiences an attack during a massage, apply warm towel to the affected areas or submerge them in warm water if possible. Superficial warming friction may be performed over the affected areas, adjusting pressure um, to the client's tolerance. Its fluid tax massage has shown to improve local peripheral um, circulation. Be sure that the client is covered at all times with a sheet, warm blanket, and electric table warmer. And all forms of um, cryotherapy, including ice packs, are contradicted. Perfect. Yeah. It's a strange thing that happens to some people where they don't get the right blood flow, especially their fingers and such. Um, and it's not caused usually by clogging of arteries, things like that, and they don't know what happens. And you would treat it kind of like you would normally think too. Massaging, it's great. And applying heat is great. You're trying to warm the area back up. So because it's quite often cold when it doesn't get blood flow to it. Awesome. Mr. Manzanares, varicose veins. This is something we will all come across, that's for sure. Sir. Yes. Um, varicose veins are also called varicocytes, or is it? Are dilated veins developed because of weakness in vessel walls? There are many different causes. One is just the simple fact of being a female, being older, being pregnant, being obese, genetics, smoking, and for standing for long periods. And when when you should go see a doctor will be when you have pain and swelling in your legs. And there's uh, many different types of treatments for it, such as such as compression stocking, elastic bandages, physical exercise as well as uh, medical procedures such as laser th therapy, radio frequencies, and as well as surgery to remove the veins when you're stripping. And yes, you can massage, but it will only help reduce the swelling and discomfort, but it won't make them go away. Cool. Thank you, sir. Thanks, <laughs> That's good. No, thank you. Thanks. So everybody, uh, varicose veins, I would not massage them, by the way. You can massage the client, but I would not massage varicose veins. Uh, they can be weakened. There, there can be danger with that. It's a local contraindication. Uh, have I ever done it before? I have, by the way. I have massaged them before very lightly. Um, so I definitely think it's definitely a relative contraindication, but I'd really advise you just to avoid them altogether. Um, it has to do with blood not, venous return not working. The blood's kind of pooling, usually in the lower legs and not getting back up to the heart. Uh, yes, and they t hurt to the touch as well, Ms. Avalos. Most people don't want you to touch them. Uh, but my worry is about rupturing those veins. Uh, and by the way, um, the reason weight and those type of factors are a factor is because it creates more pooling down in your legs. But the other thing that they think really leads to varicose veins is sitting long periods of time. Because when you're sitting over the edge of a chair, your legs are bent. And it makes it hard for blood to get back up and it pools down there and it tends to lead to that sort of thing so get up from your chair every hour and walk around it's a big deal sitting is actually sitting is fine sitting for long periods of time without getting up and standing is actually a real problem the other thing they think happens with varicose veins is you have one-way valves in your in your veins you let blood come up and not come back down which is good uh those those 
those valves sometimes weaken on some people and then the blood has a hard time kind of getting through these one-way valves and it can pool back down the leg and that stretches out the veins all that stuff anyway local contraindication yeah all right cool beans uh onward and upward mr ma we're gonna see we're gonna listen for mr ma then mr lee then miss lee then mr jones then miss hendrickson then miss green mr ma tell us about anemia in 10 sentences or less sir yes sir <clears throat> so anemia is a condition in which you lack enough healthy red blood cells yeah. to carry a docrete a, a decrete oxygen to your body's tissues having an anemia um, also referred to as low Hemoglobin. Low hemoglobin, yeah. Yeah, can make you feel tired and weak. There are many forms of uh, anemia, each with its own cause. Yeah. Um, so, what is the most common cause of uh, anemia? The most common cause of uh, anemia include nutritional deficiencies, particularly iron deficiency yeah those deficiencies in uh, folate vitamins b12 and a are also important causes hemoglobin no pathes and uh, infectious diseases diseases such as malaria tuberculosis HIV and parasitic infections. So how can we tell if, if I'm a, a anemia? Anemic. Symptoms common to many types of uh, anemia include the following. Easy uh, fatigue, uh, fatigue and a loss of energy. And usually, uh, rapid heartbeat, particularly with the exercise, shortness of a breath and a headache, particularly with the exercise. So, what is the fast, fa fastest way to cure anemia? Taking iron supplies, mint pills, and getting enough iron in your food. Will correct most causes of iron uh, deficiency anemia. You usually take iron pills one to three times a day to get the most benefit from the pills. Take them with vit uh, vitamin C pills or um, orange juice. Vitamin C help your body absorb more iron. Yeah. yeah. That's it, sir. Perfect. Fantastic. Yeah. Again, your blood blood's not picking up oxygen, so you're oxygen depleted. So you feel tired and achy and all that kind of stuff. And if we can, and iron helps you pick up oxygen in your blood. It's that simple. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Lee. Hello. Hello. Angina pectoris in ten sentences or less, sir. All right. A genna pectoris is a chest pain yes. or discomfort caused uh, when your heart muscle doesn't get enough oxygen rich blood. It may feel like pressure or squeezing in your chest. The discomfort also can occur in your shoulders, arms, neck, neck, jaw, or back. A genital pain may even feel like indigestion, but a genital is not a disease. It is a symptom of a unnerly heart problem, usually coronary heart disease, CHD. There are many types of agenda, including microvascular agenda, trans metal agenda, Stable agenda, unstable agenda, and uh, variant 
agenda. This usually happens because one or more of the coronary arteries is narrowed or blocked, also called a ischemia. Agenda can also be symptom of a coronary microvascular disease, MFD. This is part of disease that affect the heart's smallest coronary arteries and is more likely to affect women than men. Coronary MVD also is called uh, cardiac symptom X and the non obstructive CHD. Uh, learn more about agenda in women depending on the types of agenda you have. There are many factors that can trigger agenda pain. The symptoms also vary based on the type of agenda you have. That's it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I really like that presentation, sir. What I really liked about it was you framed your presentation. He said, he said this is chest pain. <laughs> and he said it's chest pain due to the fact that there's some, some problem with not enough blood getting to the heart. Really good way to frame the, the whole discussion. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Miss Lee, arterial sclerosis. Yes. Arthrosclerosis. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's a narrowing of the arteries caused by a building up a plaque. Yeah. Arteries are the blood vessels that carry oxygen and the nutrients from your heart to the rest of your body. As you get older, fat, cholesterol, and the calcium can collect in your arteries and from plaque. The building up of plaque makes it difficult for blood to flow through your arteries. This build up may occur in any artery in your body including your brain, your heart, legs, and the kidneys. It can uh, result in a shortage, shortage, uh, shortage of blood and uh, oxygen uh, various tissues of your body. Pieces of plaque can also break up causing a blood clot. If left untreated, osteosclerosis can lead to heart, a heart attack, stroke, or heart failure. Um, osteosclerosis is a fairly common problem associated with aging this condition can be prevented and uh, many successful treatment uh, options with that. Yeah. And that. That's beautiful. That's exactly what I want. I want to keep them tight and short. Um, you know, Ms. Rader, you said there's common, common, uh, uh, you know, common causes of this stuff too, but it's all, I just realized I should know this already, but it just, it's all the same stuff too, right? Your arteries are getting clogged. Blood flow is not going, doesn't matter if it's varicose veins, your heart, except varicose veins are life threatening. Um, but my point is it's all about your plumbing getting clogged and not getting blood to areas or the blood itself is not carrying oxygen well. Yeah. Very well said. Uh, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, what is congestive heart failure? Briefly. Uh -huh. It is the heart's inability to pump blood to meet the body's demands. Um, it's not actually a single disease. It's rather a complication of other diseases such as hypertension, coronary artery disease, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, 
or combination, essentially. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the term congestive describes what happens when blood backs up into the lungs, liver, or other organs and lower extremities. Yeah. Uh, the most common form is left side of the heart, but regardless of that, usually if one side fails, then the other usually follows. So that doesn't really matter, essentially. Yeah. But the left side usually happens quicker. Um, it may occur as an acute episode, but it is usually a chronic condition. So some, I guess it means it can have flare-ups, essentially. And then for massage, um, so it just depends, I guess, on how bad it is. Usually you would want to postpone it until the condition resolves. But it also says that massage reduced anxiety and blood pressure and decreased heart rate and respiratory rate and increased blood oxygen saturation levels in patients with uh, congestive heart failure. Yeah. So it can help for sure. I guess you just you just want to look at the client and make sure that you can massage them yeah. and be gentle essentially. Don't yeah. go too crazy. Well said. Thank you. Yeah. If they can walk, if they can walk in to see you, it's very unlikely that your massage is going to be more taxing than the walk into your studio, right? Yes, um, exactly. Right. Massage is actually not very taxing on the client unless you tear them up. You know what I mean? But basically they're laying down, so they're okay. If they got to you and they look basically okay, you're okay. Um, so awesome. Yes, yes, yes. And uh Miss Hendrickson. Coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease. Um, coronary artery disease develops when the major blood vessels that supply your heart become damaged or diseased. Cholesterol containing deposits or plaques uh, in your coronary arteries and inflammation are usually the cause. Uh, a buildup of plaque. Um, can narrow these arteries, decrease the blood flow to the heart. Uh, eventually, the reduced blood flow may cause uh, angina, shortness of breath, and lead to a heart attack. Coronary artery disease is thought to begin with damage or injury to the inner layer of the coronary artery of a coronary artery, which may be caused by factors such as smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol diabetes or insulin resistance, and a sedentary lifestyle. Um, advanced age increases the risk of damaged and narrowed arteries. Men are generally at greater risk. However, the risk for women increases after menopause. A family history of heart disease is associated with a higher risk, especially if a close relative developed a heart disease at an early age. Heavy alcohol use can lead to heart muscle damage and worsen other risk factors of coronary artery disease. And to improve your health, follow these tips. Quit smoking, um, control conditions such as high blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes, stay physically active, and eat, uh, eat a low fat, high, a low cholesterol diet, rich in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Um, maintain a healthy weight and reduce and manage stress, which massage would help with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your pen, perfect 10 sentences. That was really yeah. good. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely not going to start. I, I like them out. <laughs> yeah, definitely not going to start smoking after listening to this. Uh, okay. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Richards. Can I ask, is there any benefit to smoking? Because it seems like there is no benefit whatsoever. No, there's not. Benefit? There's no There's no benefit that I can possibly think of. And I am not, by the way, I used to smoke and I'm not somebody who feels judgmental about it. I mean, I guess the benefit is it's a pleasurable activity at times, but I, I, I can't. And by the way, there might be a social benefit. Okay. I mean, there's been many a great conversation had around, around uh, a smoking area and things like that, but smoking Cigarettes, I can't think of a, on a regular basis something. Ms. Everson, do you have a benefit to smoking? I was going to say the social aspect. Yeah. And one other thing that I would recommend, or 
recommend. I really recommend that, but I love it. You take time um, out of a social event for yourself and you kind of decompress for a little while. So kind of get like five to ten minutes of just hanging out by yourself, which can be really nice in social events and kind of take time for yourself. Which is people you think why like, people have done it for all these hundreds of years. Um, you know, because it's been going on a long time. Sure. Um, that well, all these things are the cause of it. And I don't know if they're just putting that in there because I know people that have had lung cancer and never smoked in their life. Sure. Um, so there is, the, you know, sure, sure. Point of about it. Um, sure. Well, so by the way, everything in moderation, right? Um, and, you know, when when a group of people get around and have a cigar together once a month, that's a lot different than somebody carrying two packs of cigarettes in their, their pocket and smoking all day long, right? And so I, I think everything depends on how you utilize it and the social context it's in uh, and all that, all that good stuff. And by the way, these are risk factors. You could do all these things. You could drink, smoke, be overweight, and never have heart problems. It just means you're much more likely to. There have been people who have had heart attacks that were marathon runners. They were doing everything right, but you are more likely in these situations. Ms. Avalos, I would love to hear your thoughts. But you are muted, and I'm a bad lip reader. I pushed the hand button instead of the microphone. <laughs> There's a lot of benefits of nicotine on the, the and its interaction with the chemicals in your brain. Um, they used to give uh, cigarettes as a treatment to psychiatric patients back in the oh, day, yeah. um, and they they showed great improvements um, in their mental health when they did use nicotine products. Oh. Um, I'm not saying it's okay to use because no, no. there's a risk, you know. Sure. So, do the benefits outweigh the risk? Um, Who knows? For some people it does, for some people it doesn't. Um, but I do know that nicotine has been used in the mental health field uh, for quite some time. Yeah. Um, it also has been told to improve memory uh, concentration. Um, it also promotes relaxation because you are consciously breathing deep and exhaling and so you're focusing on your breath and it's easier for people with monkey minds to do that whole process of in and out and and having the vagal nerve response um so there's a lot of, of benefits uh, but then again there's a lot a lot of bad too uh, it's it's what 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 uh, gives you a better quality of life for some people that are suffering with mental disease they would rather risk their physical sure. health because they're in this this prison an interesting thing too is nicotine was also when the coronavirus just started they said that nicotine yes. was a potential cure and treatment for the coronavirus they had a pill developed within one month that the yeah. tobacco industry did yeah. that said that had nicotine in it that could help. So I don't I don't know. That's just kind of my soapbox on no, no. nicotine. I don't even think it's your soapbox. I love how you presented it. Nothing is all bad or good. I mean, I guess, you know, nothing really. So yeah, it's very true. And I actually can tell you that when I did smoke, there, there were mental health aspects of it. I just felt physically worse. <laughs> but I, it is. It gives you this kind of time and this calming and this thing that, and mental is very important too. Miss Sabrina, what do you have to weigh in on this discussion, please? Okay, so I remember seeing propaganda of doctors, you know, promoting smoking cigarettes in the, uh, you know, 50s or 60s. Yeah. But I picked up smoking whenever I was in Afghanistan because there's a lot of stressful situations over there, and that helped calm me down. But then I quit when I got here. But my grandpa, who's Sicilian, drank wine, glass of wine every meal, and smoked cigarettes for like 30 years, and he's still like 93 and kicking it. So yeah. I think there's, you know, I think it's all about your mindset and like what you're using it for, but also doing it in moderation. But he quit now. Right. But still, you know, I just feel like doctors were well, promoting it. Yeah. And I like what you're saying. Um, there definitely is a, a lot of evidence to suggest the emotional attitude you have when you are ingesting something really matters. Right. 
Right. If you go to a party and you're drinking and you have a lovely time, you feel a lot less hungover the next day than if you go to a party and get in a fight with your girlfriend, right? And then the next day, even though you have the same amount of alcohol, like things affect you very differently. And so your your grandfather living a really happy life and enjoying his wine and smoking, like it's very different than somebody who's depressed at home, you know, chain yeah, smoking yeah, away, yeah. right? Very yeah. different life, very different life, yes. Uh, Ms. Hendrickson. He, uh, yeah, I just wanted to add also that um, besides nicotine, there's a lot of other chemicals oh, yeah, sure. involved in cigarettes. And so you're also, you know, there's also a risk of, um, you know, there's like carcinogens and stuff like that oh, in sure. cigarettes. So yeah. it's not just the nicotine um, in there. And then I think, I mean, I, I don't know if vaping is like safer. I think it has less, but I think there are still chemicals involved sure. in that. So. Just something to kind of consider because yeah. those things are added to make it even more yeah. addictive. And, um, yeah, you're right. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the tobacco industry is like fun. Well, <laughs> then we're we're talking about a really neat subject too because it touches on a personal decision we all have to make, which is how much pleasure do I want to have in my life and how carefully do I want to live it, knowing that we're all going to die. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's and, something that um, a friend said to me recently that I mean I've probably heard before, but um kind of resonated with me was that like happiness true happiness is living in alignment with your values and so the yeah. values are different for everyone yeah but, um, beautiful beautiful you know, if you hate what you're doing and you feel guilty or ashamed of it all the time then it's going to be a, a lot different than if yeah. you're like yeah it's fine <laughs> yeah. So. very cool thank you Ms. Hendrickson Mr. Richards Thanks. Yeah, I have that kind of mental thing like, you know, we're only here once, um, let's enjoy ourselves while we're here. I mean, don't go too crazy and don't harm yourself stupidly, but um, I think, yeah, you should you should do what you want while you're here within reason because, you know, if you if you never had a donut and then you die, it's like when you're dead, oh, I wish I tried that donut. Yeah. Um, so try things and if you like it, like it. If you don't, you don't. But, I never hear of any benefits to all these things that are supposed to be bad for you. Um, and I never heard smoking as one, and thanks to Zabalos, you know, at least we've got some positive we do. thought to it. And actually, um, but yeah, I think. Sorry. Very good, sir. I just love what you said because I just realized I used to smoke because I like to smoke. And then after a while, I stopped liking it because it was making me feel tired all the time. And then I kind of struggled with that. And I actually came to the conclusion you were talking about, Mr. Richards. One day I was like, why am I going back and forth on this? I basically don't like it. And so I stopped doing it. Like, I really wonder if I could truly do that with my life, if I could truly do what I like to do and stop doing it when I don't like it anymore. Like the fifth donut may not be as pleasurable as the third donut, right? That kind of stuff. And I don't know what that number is, but, but that really is a very interesting life kind of thing that you've brought up there. Um... Miss Everson, you have your hand up. It might be left over. I just want to check. No, I have a question. No, oh, please. Uh, yeah, get us. I have a question with Mr. Law, actually. Is uh, are you are you how are you doing on quitting smoking? Oh, that's right, Mr. Ma. Oh, um, well, I have to close the door. I mean, I also this question. Okay. <laughs> I understand this too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have tried many many times actually. Uh, the the most uh, successful time uh, was uh, three months. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that, that was the when the COVID nineteen just started. I cannot uh, come out from the house, so I have to be with my wife together all the time. So I don't have any alternative. Yeah. But uh, I uh, yeah, in the in the first uh, couple of weeks, that that's really. You know, you just you just do like this because uh, because you can still feel a little bit the uh, cigarette flavor from from your mouth. So <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, but after two weeks, it's it's going to be better and better. Uh, and then uh, the you know the the death the despire is less and less. Uh, up, actually, after uh, three months, I think I'll be okay with, without that. But uh, you know, I just went to Las Vegas. Uh, I think, oh, you know, I I need something, <laughs> you know, because it's Las Vegas, right? Yes. 
Yeah, uh, I so like right now, you know, if uh, I answer you uh, hundred percent without secrets, it's fine. But I can control myself very well, like very less, and um, just change your mind when you don't want to smoke, think something else. Um, yeah, it really helped me. So I think everybody had tried. Uh, I mean, all the smokers have tried to quit that, step, but it's not that easy. Uh, but we can, like uh, Miss uh, Cario told me before, we can just do less and less, less and less. So if you have that, uh, uh, if we want to quit that, we can just, you know, step by step, we will finally make it zero. So yeah. this is what I'm working now. Yeah. Thank you for being so honest. Well, I can tell you that you were an inspiration because hearing that you were quitting made me feel like I was not alone. And I don't want to name drop anybody, but somebody else is also potentially quitting. And so there's a group of us uh, trying to quit now in the class. And uh, I think you said, Mr. Mark. I love yeah, it. Let's, let's do that together. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I will, say, I will say one thing. Remove all the judgment from it. Uh, that helps. And But do remember, clients absolutely hate the smell of smoke on your hands. I've, I've dealt with complaints from clients about that kind of stuff, uh, and it's really hard to get out of your hands. I mean, it's really hard. It really sits there. Yeah. So that's a little bit of motivation for that. Mr. Tapscott, can I ask you, do you have any um, smoke experience before? Yeah. I used to smoke. I was a closet smoker for uh, 20 years. Whoa. Uh, so what really, I'm sorry, I don't mean to go on and on about smoking, but anyway, uh, but what really helped me was a couple things. One is I was a massage therapist um, and I couldn't smell like smoke, so I never smoked at work. And so the less places that it's involved in your life, the easier it is to take it out of your life. And so I tended to smoke before in the morning when I'd get up and then shower and clean up and go to work. And then at night when I'd come home. Now, I still manage some days when I was really bad to still somehow get in a pack or two of cigarettes that be, before and after work. Um, I really go for it when I indulge in stuff, which is not a good thing. Um, but anyway, I, I just started to reduce like that too. And I started to realize I wasn't feeling good uh, and I didn't enjoy it. At first, I did it for stress relief and it really helped. Um, but after a while, it started to stress me out that I wasn't feeling good. And I switched to vaping, um, which... If you really like smoking, switching to vaping is a little bit hard too, but for, that gave me a hand to mouth thing to do. And then I just, all of a sudden the vaping wasn't quite as good as smoking, but I didn't want to go back to smoking. I just one day just realized I just put it down. And people say that you crave it forever. I haven't even thought about it. And I don't mean like I'm so superior. I have all sorts of bad habits I'm working with, but, but I just never thought about it again. I've never craved it. I have no desire. And I would say about six months ago, I was out with my girlfriend and we were like a cigar shop and I'm like, Oh, I want to get a cigar. And she's like, get one. And I'm like, I can't wait to smoke this cigar. And I smoked that cigar. And I was like, and I used to love cigars, loved them. And I was like, Oh, this is, I didn't finish it. I just kind of lost it. I just, I don't know. I can't, so I, you know, yeah. That's it. That's my experience. Okay. Oh my gosh. Really quickly, uh, Miss Clayton, because I expect you have something to tell us about massage therapists and smoking. Oh yeah, I used to smoke too when I was young, and um, yeah, it took me a while. I just kind of like you did. I gradually stopped, and then I would tell myself because my big thing was drinking. So every time I had a drink, I wanted to smoke. Oh yeah. So <clears throat> I kept pushing it up. I'm like, okay, if you have four drinks, and this sounds totally stupid but you can smoke if you have like four drinks but I kept like pressing pushing it up because obviously I didn't want to drink that much either so um I every once in a while now when I drink a lot I want a cigarette and it's like 25 years I quit but um but the the smoking um if you're I got a facial once it was one of the first facials I ever got I think I was like 17 or 18 yeah. and the girl that gave me the facial smoked and the whole time I was getting the facial, I was cringing because it smelled absolutely awful. Yeah. Um, and then I got home and I had a migraine, it triggered a migraine that lasted three days. So I was like, I don't want another facial ever. It was a horrible experience. And, I, and it just, it the smoke can trigger other people to have really bad experiences too. So yeah. just make sure if you do smoke, you wash your hands, wash your hands um, and try to get that smoke off. Wash them in bleach because it takes about that much to get the smell out. 
Okay, Miss Green. I'm um, sorry, this is not smoking related. I just wanted to know, am I going to be able to um, present just tomorrow then? No, Miss Green, let's have you present right now. Cool. Right. <laughs> Thank vein, you. Thrombosis, Thank you. Um, and inflammation of a deep vein with thrombosis or blood clots, basically, that forms um, in your body. And inflammation attracts um, platelets where, um, where they form clots. And often it's near a, um, a venous valve. Mm -hmm. um, this can restrict blood flow. And if a clot becomes dislodged, um, they are known as thromboboli. <laughs> um, most cr uh, critical issue uh, with a blood clot in the, uh, in the leg is the possibility of the clot being lodged into a pulmonary artery, um, leading to pulmonary embolism which is a life-threatening condition. Um, if your client currently has deep vein thrombosis, uh, you should definitely postpone the massage um, and screen an at -risk, um, any at-risk clients, such as those who are obese, um, maybe just had surgery, have cancer, are pregnant, et cetera. Um, signs and symptoms of DVT are unilateral leg swelling, heat, redness, pain, and tenderness. Um, if a client has any of these symptoms, recommend them seeing a healthcare provider. Um, this vigorous massage to the legs was found to cause uh, venous throm thrombolism or uh, blood clots um, that release in a vein. That's, That's beautiful. Again, DVT, everybody can kill somebody. One leg tends to look swollen and hot and painful as opposed to the other one. If they both are, are painful, you're probably okay. But it's when they look uneven it really uh, by the way a blood clot is a scab inside your body that's what it is it's a scab inside your body and it can clog up stuff very well done thank you for getting us back on track miss green i'm going to keep pressing forward to make sure we get to everybody else uh because we can go on and pontificate over things forever um mr godot can you quickly remind us what hypertension is why is my camera of quarters hello yeah yeah sorry sorry so that's not me waving at you funny that's me trying to get my camera to track me again oh okay i'm cool. trying to learn how to talk to it all right so i have hypertension which is uh, basically high blood pressure um it's a condition where in which force of the blood against the artery the uh, walls is too high um, so high blood pressure often has no symptoms over time, and if they're untreated, it can cause health conditions such as uh, heart disease and stroke. Uh, it does require a medical diagnosis. There are about 3 million U.S. cases per year, and it can be treatable by a medical professor. professional. But it's basically taking care of yourself as far as eating healthier diet with less salt, exercising regularly, and taking medication. That can help lower the pressure. But it's really up to you. You have to take care of yourself. Sir, that was actually really well said. Yeah, there's medication to treat it, but actually the best stuff to do is to take better care of yourself. You're right. Because sometimes people even be on multiple high blood pressure medications. It doesn't do a whole lot. Um, okay. Miss Everson, myocardial infarction. Just remind us what that is. Thank you, ma'am. Uh -huh. Myochondral infraction, MI, commonly known as a heart attack, occurs when the blood flow decreases or stops to the coronary artery of the heart, causing damage to the heart muscles. This muscle often happens because of plaque, um, a sticky, sticky substance that can build up on the insides of your arteries, similar to how pouring grease down a kitchen sink can clog your home. Plumbing, as you were saying. Um, the most common symptom is chest pain or discomfort, which can travel into the arm, back, neck, um, or jaw. Um, often it occurs in center or left side of the chest and lasts for more than a few minutes. Risk factors include high blood pressure, um, smoking, diabetes, or yeah. um, <laughs> lack of exercise, obesity high blood cholesterol, poor diet, and excessive alcohol intake. Mm. Um, attacks actually happen to about 635,000 people in the U.S. each year. 
Um, about 300,000 people a year have a second heart attack. Although there are several risk factors that you can't control, there are many ways you can help yourself to reduce the risk of heart attack. These include um, scheduling a checkup, um, finding a primary care provider to see you at least once a year for checkup and wellness visit. These include your blood pressure, blood sugar levels, cholesterol levels, and mood. Quitting tobacco products. <laughs> this includes smokeless tobacco and vaping products. Um, exercising regularly, um, aim for about 20 to 30 minutes of moderate intense physical activity a week. Eating healthy diet, examples include a Mediterranean or plant-based diet. Um, approach is an excellent alternative, so great job, Mr. Tapscott. Um, maintain a healthy weight. Um, manage, your extra, uh, blah, blah, blah. manage your existing health conditions. This includes high cholesterol, blood pressure, and diabetes. Um, reducing your stress. Um, consider techniques such as yoga, deep breathing, meditation, and massage. <laughs> Take your meditations, of course. And uh, keep your medical appointments because um, these can be treated um, sooner rather than later. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, by the way, uh, there's a lot of studies that suggest that performing massage therapy counts as exercise, right? It's kind of at the level of walking because it requires at work and you are doing it for long periods of time. It's long, slow, sustained exercise. So it's way better than sitting at an office desk. So that is good news. You guys are getting exercise while you're working on clients. Not only are you bringing their blood pressure down, you're probably bringing your own blood pressure down. Thank you, thank you. Um, Miss DeBose, quickly tell us what peripheral arterial disease is. It's too late. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, per, how do you call that? Per, yeah, peripheral, peripheral. Peripheral artery disease is a common circulation problem in which narrowed arteries reduce blood flow to your limbs. Um, when you develop pad your extremities, usually your legs don't receive enough blood flow to keep up with demand. Um, signs and symptoms, so you can get painful cramping, cramping in your hip, calf or thigh muscles after certain activities such as walking or climbing stairs, lung, um, not lung, leg numbness or weakness, coldness in your lower leg or foot, especially compared to the other side. Um, you have sores on your toes, feet, or legs that won't heal, a change in color on your legs, hair loss or slower growth on your feet and legs, um, slower growth of toenails, no pulse or a weak pulse in your legs or feet. Um, risk factors include smoking, diabetes, um, obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, increasing age, um, especially after reach, reaching 50, and family history of PAD, um, heart disease, or stroke. Um, for diagnosis, you have to get a physical exam, an ankle uh, brachial index. It compares the blood pressure in your ankle with the blood pressure in your arm. Um, you might have to get an ultrasound. and then treatment so to manage symptoms you would have to try to resume physical activity um, you'd want to stop the progression of this disease throughout your body to re reduce um, your heart attack and stroke if you quit smoking that could definitely be beneficial um, sometimes lifestyle changes are not enough and you'll need additional medical treatment so you may get medicine to prevent blood clots lower blood pressure and cholesterol and control pain and other symptoms and then for massage, I was actually kind of confused on if you can massage this, but from a couple hospital websites, it says that you need to be gentle and careful when you massage this. Um, you could possibly, it says cleave an um, ar arterial deposit, which might be dangerous for the I mean, you could, you could break free something, but it's really, yeah. uh, it's really unlikely. Um, you're probably really okay massaging them if they're okay walking in to see you. Yeah. So you have to be careful yeah. and gentle. If rubbing yeah. somebody's going to kill them, they've got bigger problems than the massage. That's kind of the yeah. general approach. Yeah. Cool. Yay. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Uh, Miss Dimitruk. 
What is phlebitis? Ah, oh, yeah, oh, we can't hear you, by the way, just so you know, we see really pretty pictures, but we don't hear you, because you're muted, by the way, Miss Dimitrick. Uh, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, phlebitis means inflammation of a vein. The oh. prefix thrombo comes from the Greek thrombos, meaning a lump or clump or curd or clot of milk. So thrombophlebitis is due to one or more clots in the vein that can cause inflammation. Uh, symptoms generally tend to be pain, sensitivity, redness, and bulging of the vein. And the symptoms of thrombophlebitis are similar, but the pain might be experienced throughout the entire limb or the whole limb might suddenly swell. Yeah. Causes, risks, and prevention. Phlebitis is caused by trauma or injury to the veins or inflammation caused by blood clots in the veins, which can be um, from, or can be from, oh my God, this is bad, due to a, a venous injury or complication from surgical procedure. High risk factors that increase the chance of a clot forming include, which you've not heard these before, Obesity, smoking, pregnancy, sedentary lifestyle, immobility for long periods, uh, varicose veins, and some oral contraceptives or hormone replacement therapy, and certain medical conditions like cancer or blood disorders. Although phlebitis cannot be always be prevented, controlling the risk factors can help by staying active and exercise frequently. Take long walks on flights and wear flight socks. Stop smoking or lose weight. This is just a picture cool. of shows you that the um, phlebitis is kind of a superficial or in those smaller veins where your uh, DVT is in that big, thick vein. Yes, much more serious. Yes, DVT is much more um, serious. Yeah. Yeah. Can you massage? Maybe. I mean, I saw one site that's like, oh, if you got this, don't touch them. You know, you're yeah. going to break off the clot and it'll go. Yeah. But in the book, it's just like, stay away from that area. Yeah. So, that's what I call it as a local contraindication. Yeah. Yeah. But, cool. That's all. Thank you, ma'am. That was great. Thank you. Very concise. Miss Dang. Miss Dang, are you there? Miss Dang? Hi. Oh, you're driving. That's actually okay. Miss Dang, just tell us in like two or three sentences, what is Raynaud syndrome? But we can't hear you. You're muted. So cute. She's probably coming to school right now because she lives like in another city. Yeah. Miss Dang, you're muted. We can't hear you. Well, there you are. Yes. Now we can. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Really quickly, what is Raynaud syndrome? Runners and this also called the uh, runner for uh, for for lumberers, and a condition is which some area of the body feels numb and cold in certain in certain in certain circumstances, and a small audience in response to cold, uh, limiting breath. Supply to the uh, uh, affected area, the finger, the two, the toes, the ear, and the tip of the nose are uh, usually involved and feel numb and cold. Respond to the cold temperature or stress. And uh, it also companies to change in the color of the skin. And massage is a indicated and may improve the Yes, that was perfect. That was perfect. It's cold fingers and toes and nose. Keep them warm and rub them. Mr. Craven, I am hoping you can deliver on the boring presentation that you promised very quickly <laughs> in 36 seconds. What are varicose veins, sir?
Okay. Okay. Uh, varicose veins are twisted, swelled veins from vessels, wall weakness that typically show in legs. Uh, slightly more common in women. Uh, these veins also show in smaller veins and can be known as spider veins. Avoid the area of pressure or if there's any pain in the area or if the client has a history of blood clots or BBT. Uh, also, you can place client's legs on some pillows or a larger bolster to make them physically higher than the heart to assist in the lymphatic drainage. Uh, remember that varicose sounds similar to very close. And if you can see these veins on the surface of the epidermis, it doesn't help or it doesn't hurt to check in with the client on how they would like them approached. I love that. Very co close. Uh, Mr. Craven, you did not disappoint. Thank you. It's 11 o'clock, everybody. I've released your homework. I apologize for just packing this. Have the way. Question, though. Yeah. Uh, but those of you who need to leave can leave. And Mr. Craven, you ask away. I'm not going anywhere. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what do you call a person from Venezuela that has very close veins? What do you call a person from Valenzuela who. Venezuela. Venezuela who has varicose veins? Uh, yes, I don't know. What do you call? Vein of swelling. Vein of swelling. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Not as good as Haipu, hi but very good. Yeah. Thank you. That's exactly what they are. They are swollen veins. Yes. Yes. If they look raised up, it's a problem, everybody. Um, if you're just seeing spider veins on the surface, which people don't like the way they look, but they're not raised all, that's not a problem. But raised up is the problem. Awesome, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience, your indulgence, your input, uh, all that good stuff. We will see you at lab today. Yes. Miss Clayton, talk to me. Um, if we do, if we're practicing stones,